this week has been somewhat the culmination of uh, quite a journey of study. And um, so I want to report on that. These are the things that I hope... I want to go to that second slide. These are the things that I hope to cover. Uh, November 1st, 1981, 2018. This is our 37th year. Uh, the journey, I've been on a journey of study the last three weeks, four weeks, uh, more intently the last three weeks. Um, uh, Howard Pittman, HP is Howard Pitton, Pittman, and a book he wrote called Placebo and the place, the impact that it's had on the International House of Prayer Kansas City. And Howard Pittman, pl Placebo, the impact it have, is having, at least through me, on NCF. Uh, timing of the end time harvest. Uh, over the past several years, and I've focused on it the last three weeks, uh, I've heard Bob Jones make a number of statements regarding the timing of the end time harvest when the, uh, the, the, the major event starts to take place. And so it's not down to a day or an hour, and I'm not talking at all about the second coming of Jesus. I think that's many years away. Uh, but timing of the end time harvest, I want to look at that. Uh, resurrections and the, uh, the end time harvest. Uh, this is pointing in the direction of Saint Seraphim. And I've noticed several of the end time harvest visions, people, significant persons, personalities, how in many of them a, a resurrection from the dead is a part or the beginning part of the, the messages that, that they have. Uh, Norval Hayes, <clears throat> there are several numbers that he have been very significant. I've heard lots of Norval Hayes uh, since the middle of the summer, uh, but especially the number 42, the number 34 and 8, and 40, 40, 40 days and 40 nights he prayed for his daughter Zona and NCF. And I want to finish, if there's still a bit of time, of the road to Mount Carmel. So that's what my intentions are. So starting and doing them in that order, some of them are longer, some of them are shorter. But November 1st, 1981, I told you this morning that I'd really lost track of that in terms of New Covenant and it being our anniversary date. It's not one that we've been planning to do anything celebratory. And it just escaped, it just escaped my, uh, my, my knowledge. I was aware November 1 was coming, but, but not especially in terms of New Covenant. So we've been November 1, uh, 2018 was our first meeting Sunday. 81, 2081, uh, and, and we have now passed November the 1st, 2018. It's 37 years. I had no idea what 37 meant. It is something that's a part of my journey. Um, to some degree, everything that ha God has made available to us in Christ Jesus, I wish I could say all of us are availing ourselves of all of it, and we're walking in the full manifestation of every dimension of what's been made available in Jesus. I find that we are not. I find that it's typical for people to have one, two, three, four, five areas that they may be particularly strong in. I find that people, it's not uncommon that there are some areas that they're not strong in at all. Uh, I have found Norval Hayes has been addressing it, uh, and I find it the most comfortable that everything that God has done for us in Christ Jesus is available in Christ. And all of the riches and glory that God has in Christ Jesus, they are available. But they are obtained by faith. Yes, there are time periods when God sovereignly just bequeaths. But in general, our journey is a faith journey because of the laws of grace. So if you have faith developed into an area that... Uh, that others may not. I believe one of the areas that uh, God has been working with me from years and years and years is that in, in his sovereign working and in timing, and he orchestrates things. And uh, I, as the years have gone on, I tend to see it. Uh, I tend to have more faith in it. And uh, God tends to show it to me. So I think I experience a greater measure of that than many people experience. And the more of it you experience, the more you walk in faith for healing, the more you'll see healing, the more you'll see healing in yourself and others, the more you have faith in finances that God provides. He provides all your needs, that he provides with a great multiplication. What you believe God for, 
of the things that are available in Christ, those are the things you tend to see, you tend to talk about, you tend to talk with others about. So this dimension of years and the meaning of years and time and the passages of time, uh, I've gotten in trouble with that, and it's also been incredibly meaningful. And it has opened up their great dimensions of my life. If, if someone came and said, I wish I could see God doing something in my life, I think I've just basically lived a life where God has just not been a part of it. I'd have to say, I, I really am sorry for you. I don't. That, that has not been my experience, and it's not because I'm better or more, but I'm really sorry that's your experience. So in this instance, when I recognized it was our 37th year, then the first thing I would do is go and look and say, I wonder what... 37 means. And what's the significance of this, of the, the November 1st? And so uh, jumping to the significance is why is November 1st so significant to me and this congregation? And it was a con it's our congregation birth date. And so for me, its primary is the congregation, the calling that's on this body of people. Yes, I do believe God's called me to be to lead this, at least up to this point in time, but I believe it's the congregation calling. I do have a personal calling, but it's the congregation calling. In 1979, Bob Jones had a vision that he calls the Sands of Times. He saw a number of leaders through history in this vision experience uh, they went up to the ocean. The ocean was time. The sands were the, the sands of time, the passage of time through all the years. And he saw many significant leaders of the past in this vision reach down in the sand and pull up a box. It was a shoe box, and they were all empty, making it quick. Bob, the Lord told Bob, put your hands down in the sands of time. He did. He pulled up a box. He didn't want to because everybody else who preceded him, he said approximately 100 people, they all came up with empty boxes. And his, uh, when he pulled it up, he opened it up, and it actually had 300,000 letters in it. He was told by God that's how many letters he had, 300,000. And he opened up one of the letters, <clears throat> and uh, the letter said, the heading of it, greeting, you're inducted into the army of God. You've been inducted into the army of God. And there were no stamps on the letters. <clears throat> and so in the absence of stamps, Bob noted that, mentioned that to the Lord, and the Lord said, when it costs 20 cents to mail a letter in the United States, I am mailing this out, or at least the first of them. Not all 300,000 uh, I, I've listened to many tapes over the last several weeks uh, regarding this uh, and interviews that Bob Jones had. And it was clear that not all of the 300,000 were sent out right away, but the first of them were sent out on the day when it cost 20 cents to uh, mail a letter. So uh, I went to the United States Postal Rates, and uh, there's an article by the historian of the United States Postal Rates, and um, it, it was from the United States Postal Service, and it was March 2018, the article. And for those of you who are interested, I've given the, um, the website. So I know that if you l watch the video, you'll be able to pick it up. I'm going too quickly for you to write it down. And this is a small portion of it. Um, and so this is the rates, domestic uh, letters since 1963. And in March the 2nd, the earliest that I chose to include, they have it much farther back, uh, which was 1974, they were 10 cents. In, uh, in May the 29th, 1978, they were 15 cents. In March 22nd of 1981, they rose to 18 cents. Bob was told many times by many people when he gave this property pro prophecy in 79 that it would never happen. He said he was told many times, you're a false prophet. Stamps are never going to rise to 20 cents in the United States. They're going to go down. He, he, he just stressed that, how much he was called, again, a false prophet, false prophet, because that would never happen. As it was, November the 1st, 1981, and they went to 20 cents. That's when it was required to, to use a 20 cent stamp for a first class letter in the United States. February 17th, 1985, they rose to 22 cents, and they've been continually rising since then. Uh, it probably was 15 years before I even heard of the Sands of Time vision. That meant nothing to me. It was interesting to me that there, God is more involved in our lives than we realize. The first message that I gave at New Covenant, I had every intention of giving a message on first fruits uh, because I intended for us to give the entire offering back to Trinity Chapel. 
We were borrowing seats from them. We were borrowing sound system from them. We were borrowing, as it was, their 501c3. They didn't have one. They thought they had one, and we tried to use it for two years, and then we discovered they didn't have one, so we eventually have gotten our own. And <clears throat> so this is the 37th year. About 15 years into it, I came to realize that uh, and I know how th we started on that date. It was Faye and my intention to start six months earlier. But because of changes at Trinity, because the pastor that they wanted, it was months before he could come, and then it was even prolonged, we decided we would stay with Trinity until they had a pastor to set in place. And then we'd wait a couple of weeks, and we assumed they were calling a very strong pastor that uh, people, after a couple of weeks with that pastor, they wouldn't want to leave. And so then, whatever that time was, that dictated the time. We didn't choose November the 1. I'm not even sure I'd heard of Bob Jones at that point in time in my life. But we were sovereignly moved along by God for that date. There's a tremendous illustration of that. I'm going to sp spend the key part of it tonight. But it makes the 37th year. What does 37 mean? This is one of my favorite books. It's Numbers, The Arithmetic of God. And it's written by a Jewish uh, rabbi who his story is he spent a time period alone fasting in some kind of like a mountain cabin. And uh, he felt like the Lord wanted to unlock for him many of the numbers in the Bible. And it's really a, quite an interesting book. Uh, it's not equivalent to the Bible. It's not inerrant. Uh, but it has some fascinating connections. It has some identification of numbers that you know very well. And I didn't even know if the number 37 was going to be in there. So when I opened the book up in preparation for this to say, okay, what does 37 mean? I had no, I, with a bit of anticipation, I kept flipping the pages thinking, because it doesn't cover every number. Um, the first 20, 25, it has every one. But as it goes beyond, it skips more and more and more. So I didn't even know if it was going to cover it. It did. And so at 37 means exaltation. Well, that's an interesting word. That's his word. Not mine. That's his word. And this is where it comes from. And he cites references, and many times he does elaborate studies of counting the number values of letters that are used in verses. It's very intricate. Uh, some people are bothered by that. Some people like that. In this instance, he says it comes... This, his statement declaration is, God showed me this. He didn't start with what he knew. He said, God, now show me the number 37, as he did with all of them. What does it mean? Uh, now, it comes from Jeremiah 52, 31. Uh, now, it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity, that's where 37 comes, of the captivity of, of Je Je Jehoiachim. He was the king of Judah. He was in captivity for 37 years. And in the 37th year, in the 12th month, on the 25th day of the month, he was in Babylon. The, that evil, uh, the king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, um, he, he lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. He was in prison. He brought him out of prison, uh, Jeremiah 52, 32, and he spoke kindly to him, and he gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So this king, who's been in captivity 37 years plus 12 months plus 25 days of the, of the 11 months and 25 days of the 12th month, and he gets brought out of prison, and he gets uh, exalted above many of the other kings who were in captivity. Um, I find that uh, an encouraging word, that in some ways in which he was bound, he found release. It's a little confusing to me. I think, well, it was almost the entire year. It was the 12th month, the 25th day. But he came out of prison. Um, I like that. It's interesting, 12th month. Uh, 12 means, and he does this, this comes from the book, The Arithmetic of God. The 12th means the divine authority, the 25th day. 25 is for pardon or forgiveness, and he puts those together. And notice it's a double 37. If you add 12 and 25, you come up to 37. It was the 37th year. 
it was the 12th and, and the 37. Th those catch my attention when it's doubled, going all the way back to Joseph when he said to the king, when your dream is doubled, it's of God, means exaltation. Um, I wouldn't mind that. Uh, I feel like we have gone through a time period as a congregation. We used to be thought of real highly uh, because of me and the error that it's believed I've introduced into New Covenant. We're not thought of as highly, um, and I'm very sorry about that. Um, thank you for being here. So uh, that was not the outstanding thing of that day, uh, November the 1st. It was just, that's just interesting to me. I have found through the years, it's one of the things, one of the things I've developed faith in, another dimension, that at the beginning of something on a birthday, the beginning of the year, I've learned to notice uh, and I've developed a measure of faith in God is going to reveal a measure of what's going to happen that year through what takes place on that day. Sometimes if it's real profound on a day or two before it or a day or two after it, after it but it primarily occurs on that day. I have found... And so I've developed an a dimension of anticipation that God brings a revelation, some hint of what's coming. Uh, to you, that may be something you've never even thought of. I think of it a lot. So on that day, uh, <clears throat> I told people it was a 95% wonderful day. I've had good days. I've had okay days. That was a wonderful day. It was a 5% not a good day, but the 5% got resolved in that day and so on. So I look forward to this year, New Covenant's 37th year, that, uh, that uh, if, it's, if it ends up being a year of exaltation, so be it. Let the Lord's will be done. Number one. Number two, the journey. I've been on a journey for the last, longer than the last three weeks, but I have concentrated on the last three weeks. I wanted to write an article. It's my intention to try and write the first draft this week of an article that's somewhat entitled um, The End Time Harvest, at The Timing of the End Time Harvest as Seen Through the Prophetic Eyes of Bob Jones. I have read, I've read enough to know, I think I have a fair idea, but I just want to be clear in that. Uh, what it's not, it's not a prediction of the second coming of Christ. It has, in one sense, nothing to do with the second coming of Christ. Uh, Bob, and I certainly am among those believe Jesus is not coming. The, the earliest Jesus is coming back is when this, the end time harvest is completed, and I think there's still time after that, but has nothing to do with the second coming in that sense, other than this has to occur first. So I spent a lot of time watching, listening to Mike Bickle and Bob Jones. I spent a lot of time then... <clears throat> the journey, and I, I can't just really elaborate the journey. Um, I, I would watch and listen and dictate and just, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy the study. I enjoy being convinced, confident in what's being said and encountered that Wesley Campbell did interviews of Bob Jones. I knew that, but it's been quite a while since I was you know, familiar with that, and then as I was continuing to search and draw upon what's available on YouTube, then I saw, oh yeah, there's the Wesley, and so I've watched some of those, and uh, then in Wesley Campbell and Bob Jones, I was directed to a man, Howard Pittman, he wrote a book called Placebo, and I thought, oh yeah, I even have that book on my iPad, but you know, if you were to ask me, what's the significance of the book of Placebo? I, I don't really know. So in the journey, these different pieces would come, and over the course of three weeks, I was finding, wow, I think I, it's very complex, and it's multi-layered, but I think I'm beginning to get an idea of the multi-layered nature of it, and, um, and it was a result of the journey. Well, in the journey is this book, Placebo, by Howard Pittman. Placebo, as you know, is a... Uh, is a false or counterfeit um, uh, medicine many times, sugar pills, not always, uh, that are used sometimes in studies and sometimes they're used when people <clears throat> are significantly ill and they may try a placebo. They may lie to the patient and say, this pill is what you need. It will really help you. Now, it has absolutely zero medical value 
Uh, and it's astounding how many people through time in medical studies have been greatly benefited by medicine that they thought was just the right thing for what they were dealing with and all it was was a, a placebo. It was a false representation, but they believed it was good. So they stuck with it and they benefited from it. His point is that this is what the devil has done to the church. The devil has given a placebo to the church that all you got to do if you choose to accept Jesus Christ, all you got to do is accept him and go to church on occasion and you can live the way you want the rest of the week and uh, just try and do good on Sunday morning. But after that, just, you know, however it is you want to do, just live life that way and it makes absolutely no difference. And he has become convinced that lots of the church, especially the Western church, uh, there's a lot of that attitude and it's not at all uh, the discipleship uh, that Jesus lived or what he has called us to, placebo, uh, falsely. So it's an interesting book. It's a 50-page book. I highly recommend you read it. You can download it on Kindle. Howard Pittman, 1980. He wrote it in 1980. In the preface of the book, it was written 1980. 1981 is when New Covenant started. That's when the first uh, induction notices were sent out, 1981. On August the 3rd, 1979, Howard Pittman, a Baptist minister, he had been a police officer for many years, had been done many, many, many good works. He and his wife, when they retired, they bought some 60 acres and they uh, opened a, in essence, an orphanage for abused children. And I think, excuse me, they had 30 some children in their orphanage that they were taking care of. As a police officer, he used to approach whoever, he was a motorcycle officer for a lot. He would uh, say, okay, now the Bible says treat them, do unto others as you have them do unto you. So I'm going to treat them how, if I were in their situation, how I would want to be treated. That's how I'm going to treat them. He lived life that way. He, um, he went to, um, he studied theology. He wanted to be a pastor. Uh, at this point in time in his life, he was trying, he was running for local sheriff. He'd been encouraged to run for the sheriff. Um, he'd done a little bit. Of, it says a Baptist minister. That's a little bit of a representation. He did a little bit of preaching. He thought he would do a whole lot more, uh, but he did lots and lots and lots and lots of good works. Uh, a Baptist minister suffered physical death. This is what they say in his book that he wrote. He suffered physical death as a result of a massive internal hemorrhage. Uh, one of the arteries, he has a trunk line artery. You have one inside your body cavity, and it burst, and it burst in a direction, kind of in an opposite direction. It was very hard to find. It took him quite a while to find it. Uh, he died multiple times, came back to life, died multiple times. So when he died, his he said uh, when the angels came and took his spirit out of his body and about to take him through what he described as the transition wall, and he said it was right there in the hospital emergency room where he was, or operating room, or intensive care. Um, he spent a couple of days in the hospital and just died multiple times. Uh, that Just before he went through the transition wall into the spirit realm, uh, the thought came to him. He acknowledged it was God who gave him that thought. The thought came to him. I think I'm going to ask these angels to take me, and I want to ask an audience at the throne of God for if I, he would give me some extra time. And he was thinking, you know, I've actually been a pretty good guy. Uh, I've done lots of good works, and I think I've got a good chance of God extending my life. That He said that thought came to his mind. He again acknowledged, he, he's convinced God gave him that thought because God wanted him to have that thought because God wanted him to ask to have a, an audience with the Lord uh, so all of this would take place. This has everything to do with the end time harvest. This has everything to do with Kansas City Fellowship, IHOP. It has everything to do with us. But at the moment, we're talking about in Louisiana, this man by the name of Howard Pittman. So um, he wanted to go, and he asked the angels, to the, a couple of angels that got, gather, gathered him, uh, would you take me to heaven? I want to, I'm asking for an audience with God, and I want to appeal for my life. They first took him on a tour of the second heaven. That is, uh, that's worth the price of the book. Um, it's, it's something else. He describes what he saw, all the hierarchy. It's not my intention to go in that. Uh, so visit one, 
is he had an extensive tour of the second heaven of the demonic hierarchy, how they deceive. Um, he watched demon possession take place. The angels showed him a lot. And then eventually uh, they took him up to the third heaven. And in visit one, they told him, I've heard many different stories about people going to heaven. They told him, you can't go in the gates. You can stand beside the gate. You can call out. God will hear you. He will speak to you. But if you go in the gates, you cannot come back out. He, he had permission to go in the gates. He had to make the decision. But if he went in, in his story, as he writes it in the book, and Mike Bickle interviewed him extensively because of the impact this man and this book had on Mike Bickle's life. Uh, he was convinced the man's born again, and so he decided, no, I, I have things that I want to do. I want to live longer, and so he chose, I'll stand outside the wall. So he was standing beside the gate outside the wall, just kind of yelling over the wall. He said he didn't have any trouble hearing God. He expected God to commend him for the, his nobility and all the good deeds that he did. In reality, because he approached God on the basis of his, he said, I've lived a life of worship. And uh, I've done all these good things and all, all of these things. And uh, I, I, I prepared to be a pastor or so on. And so on the basis of that, I'm asking for an extension of time. And he said, the Lord rebuked him. And he said, <clears throat> in essence, you've done all those things for yourself first. You say this is an act of worship. What you've done is <clears throat> you've started with yourself. You didn't start with me. He said to seek first the kingdom of God, the will of God, and his righteousness. In essence, you're here because you're demanding you want more time in your life. If you were seeking first me in the kingdom, what your, what your position would be, you would be asking, do you want me to come in now or do you want me to go back? What is it that you have for me? Just the way you've approached this, in essence, you've proven that you're starting with yourself. You haven't worshipped me. You've worshipped, and he describes in great deal, that's not what he was expecting. It was mortifying to him, humiliating, and uh, he had nothing to say. He said, how can you answer Almighty God? He talks about his voice and, and so on. And the two angels picked him up, his limp, wet, soaked body, with strength, and brought him back, took him through uh, the uh, <clears throat> right, right, right where the transition wall was, and uh, they brought him into the room. They are invisible, they're spirits. And just before he's, uh, they were about to put him back in his body, he was dead. Uh, he said, you know, God never answered me whether he would extend my life. Uh, he said, I want to go back uh, because I want to find out from God w whether he's going to extend my life or not. He didn't really get it. So the angels picked him up and went back through the transition wall and according to his story, went back up to heaven and took him outside the wall again. So he again, this was visit two. And uh, in visit two, he said he encountered the, the love of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God, the pain of God as he came to realize these things and he came to realize the love of the Father for him and that he was as pained that he, just like you have pain sometimes when your children have pain, he, the Father, displayed his pain. All of this he was speaking over the wall. He was speaking from his throne, but he was speaking over the wall. At least that's how Howard Pittman writes it. He ended visit two with essence saying, oh, what do you want? Your will, not mine. Your will. And God said, I have an assignment for you. I have a message that I want you to bring. There are five points to this message. I want you to take it back, and I want you to, uh, you're going to be under very strict guidelines. I'm going to give you the day. He said he got all this information in heaven from over the wall. The day I want you to start it is May the 7th, 1980. And you have three years. You cannot take one day more than three years. You exactly three years, you are never to ask for money, you're never to ask for help, you're never to ask for a platform, an opening, a service, you are never to ask for any of that. I will provide all those things for you. The book testifies of the magnificent way in which God provided all of those things for him. And he had, um, so go back, start on May 7th, 1980, exactly three years. At the end of it, I will bring a sign in the heavens. You'll see a sign in the heavens as a, a sign uh, that, a supernatural sign, which is a witness that will testify to you that I have called this, I have done this. 
There are five points to the message. I'm giving one page of the beginning of each of them except for the fifth one. Mess point number one, so everywhere you go, give this message for three years. Point one was, for those who call themselves Christians, this is the Laodicean church age in which we live. A high majority of those so-called Christians are in fact living a deceived life, placebo. They talk Jesus and they play church, but they do not live it. Meaning it's not what they live 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's point number one. There's much more to it. That's just the beginning of point one. Point number two, Satan is a personal devil. Did you know that Satan is a god? Did you know that Satan deals on a personal basis with each individual? Just as Jesus deals with each individual on a personal basis. There's a lot more to say about that, but that's point number two. Point number three, to the whole world, to this, this point, covers the whole world. First is to Christians, second is a realization to everybody, certainly an emphasis on Christians. Satan is a personal devil, and he deals with you personally. He's after you personally. He, he describes a lot of that. I just read the first paragraph. Point number three, to the whole world, this is for everybody. This is Noah's second day, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So he described, we are again in the days of Noah. They lasted 100 years. They weren't short. Point number four, for those who claim to be Christians, they are supposed to be ambassadors for Christ here on the earth. One cannot have any true witness or power in his life unless they, that one uh, lives his Christian life, his fit Christian faith at all times. It's a little bit of a reiteration of one of the other points. But the emphasis, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Every week, 52 weeks a year, it, there's no end to it. And then there's point five. After these first four, I think he could have been a little surprised at point five. I am reading the whole thing of point five. What God is doing, he's unfolding through two men that we know of. There were other men that he'd already unfolded other aspects before this, but two men, Bob Jones, independently, didn't know anything about Howard Pittman. Howard Pittman, who knew nothing about Bob Jones. Bob Jones had already had his experience in, in 1975, where he died, went to heaven, and Jesus said, it's premature, I want you to go back for a billion souls. This is taking place in 79. So, point number five, this is the greatest news since the day of Pentecost. God is now in the process of recruiting an army with which he will shake this old world one more time. By working through his soldiers, God will produce great miracles that will shake the established hierarchy of the so-called organized religion that is in this world today. There, the, these soldiers that God is now recruiting will demonstrate the power of God to a greater extent than did the disciples in the Pentecostal age. Some will even be greater demonstrations than those of Elijah. This is fantastic. This is the greatest news of all time. God's recruitment for this army has been going on for some time. Some of those soldiers have been brought up to a certain level of faith and placed in a holding position where they shall remain uh, until he has brought all of the new ones up uh, to that level. Remember, the Bible says that he is the author and finisher of our faith. It is going to be through the faith of the soldiers that God will, bring, will demonstrate his great power. As was stated earlier, for a long time, he has been recruiting a few now the recruitment has begun in earnest because God is about to perform the great miracles through his army that God promised us God would do in the Bible. John the Baptist brought the spirit of Elijah into this world and he did not even know that he had it. John denied it, but Jesus confessed that it was so. 
the, the purpose of that spirit was to make straight the paths of the coming of the Lord. I declare unto you, the, the, you the soldiers who are being uh, recruited now to join with those who have been recruited in the past will bring to this world the spirit of Elijah. Again, the purpose is to make straight the paths of the coming of the Lord, for he is about to come again. You that sleep, now is the time to awaken. You who have been in that holding pattern for years, look up. You're about to be put to work. To the new recruit, I would say study the Bible diligently and seek the Lord's will in every aspect of your life. Time is short for your spiritual training, but you will be used in ways you never thought possible. You seek the Lord first in your life. You who are to be chosen are to be the soldiers of the latter reign as referred to in the scriptures. This recruitment is for the end of the great revival spoken of by the prophet Joel and begun on the day of Pentecost. The end time of that great revival is the beginning of the latter reign. So you must prepare for the, for the battle with the, di with the discipline of a professional soldier. Know this also, that this that th there shall be a time or a process of culling. Those who are not qualified to be a member of Gideon's army, just as Gideon's army in the Bible, only a select few will fit for service in the army of the Christian soldiers the Lord will use in the battle of the latter reign. Okay. That's an amazing prophecy it reads like the prophecies that the International House of Prayer came to in the first two and three years. But in the beginning of the International House of Prayer, Mike Bickle never heard the name Howard Pittman. Didn't know a thing about him. Bob didn't know a thing about him. It's like God was preparing a messenger in a most incredible way over here, Howard Pittman. God was preparing a messenger over here, Mike Bickle, uh, to lead the International House of Prayer with Bob Jones. Some of the things that God showed Bob Jones, they interact with us, I believe, and the callings that God has for us. I wish I could say the timing. Timing here. These things became the most apparent to me on Thursday, November the 1st. As Thursday, November the 1st broke open, I decided I had skim read some of Placebo the day two before. I had skim read just to, I was looking for something in particular, so I just would take a page and just scam it and so on. I, you, 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 you take nothing out of that. I, that's what I was doing. And I decided, I, and I didn't know it was November the 1st. You just have to trust me. I was just, and I said, I'm going to read that thing word for word because I'm going to find out what it was that so lit the fire of Mike Bickle that forever settled in his heart. Forever. I have been chosen by God. We have been chosen by God. This is a real thing he's doing. I am not going to doubt it ever anymore, period. It's done. I am giving myself wholeheartedly to it. That happened. So I've put here point number three, Howard Pittman and Placebo and IHOP and Mike Bickle. So here we go. In 1982, Mike Bickle was a very happy pastor in St. Louis. Uh, Kent Henry was his worship leader. He had no interest in leaving St. Louis. He was very happy. He was an anti-charismatic, uh, anti-prophecy. Uh, he was anti-anything like that. <clears throat> Church of about 500 people and uh, zealous for God. He didn't know anything about Israel. He would never prayed for Israel. Uh, those just weren't part of who he was. And God picked him. Now, if I were God... And all that I know about Mike Bickle, with the passage of time, he was a great choice. When Mike was first picked, I, and if I knew everything that I know now that Mike has shared, I would have said, I would have joined those who would have said, Mike's a terrible pick. He's, he's just a terrible pick. Okay, so in 1982, while he was still in Kansas City, there was a prophet called uh, Augustine, who he didn't know, he'd never heard of before, he didn't believe in prophets. And this man, Augustine, drove in front of the church in St. Louis where Mike was pastoring. And he, wa and he heard, this guy, Augustine, heard the audible voice of God. And he heard God say, it's for the pastor of that church right there that you just are in front of right now. 
So Augustine stopped, got out of the car, went in the church. And he was looking for the pastor. He only saw a sound man who happened to be Mike Bickle, who was fiddling with the sound equipment. And he, he said, the Lord has said. And so Mike, this Mike is not appreciating any of this. What do you mean the Lord has said? He doesn't believe the Lord speaks through people like that because he doesn't believe in. But the man gave him four points. The Lord told me four things. One is there are going to be thousands and thousands of young people that are going to come to pray in Kansas City. Number two, there's going to be full manifestations of the Holy Spirit. He had no intention of going to Kansas City. He didn't believe in the full manifestation of the Holy Spirit. There's going to be a false prophet there when you get there. He said he, he kind of believed that because all, into him all all prophets were false and th that much controversy you will have incredible controversy and you're not to answer it I will answer the controversy you're just to go on he really didn't believe it he went home and told his wife he eventually let the guy Augustine know well I'm the pastor and well that's for you circumstances worked out it's a wonderful story it's a long story he ends up in Kansas City 1983 he meets Bob Jones in March of 1983, Bob, God had been showing Bob for years that there was going to be an intercessory prayer movement of young people that was coming to Kansas City. And he, Bob Jones, God was assigning him the responsibility of helping keep that young group focused and staying in the will of God, pursuing the purposes of God. And he said, God told them they'll be dull spiritually. They won't know much. Uh, and so you'll, you, but you, you need to work with them. I've called you to work with them. So in his first encounter with Bob Jones uh, and Mike Bickle, uh, Bob dressed up in a very unusual fashion. It was uh, 70 to 80 degrees in Kansas City. He put a winter coat on, and he went in, and Bob, uh, Mike Bickle took one look at him, and Mike said, he's the false prophet. I know he's the false prophet. And he started telling him prophecies that he'd had for years and about the, the singers and the songbirds. And uh, he's, th those were singers and intercession and young people. And he said, you're going to be a youth pastor. And Mike said, no, I'm not a youth pastor. I used to be a youth pastor, but I'm now a senior pastor. Mike said, <laughs> he told him that he was a senior pastor. And Bob said, well, are you a singer? No, I don't sing. Do you play music? 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 music. No, I don't play music. Do you pray for Israel? No, I've never prayed for Israel. You, do you know anything after he talked to him nearly two hours? Do you know nothing about what I've been telling you? Mike said, no, I don't have a clue what you've told me. And Bob told him. He said, well, the Lord told me that you'd be dull, but I didn't know you'd be that dull. <laughs> so one of the things that God, God had, had arranged everything God told him that, uh, to tell Mike that uh, there was going to be a second winter and they'd be sitting around the table in Mike's kitchen and uh, the snow would be melting and Bob would tell Mike the secrets of his heart. And Bob told him this ahead of time. This is going to happen. I'm going to tell you the secrets of your heart and you will acknowledge me and accept me as a prophet of God. That would have been in March. In April, that's 1983, in April 13th, Mike was, they had started uh, prayer meetings, three prayer meetings a day. Mike had felt like, well, we're supposed to, and Bob gave him those same four points. The exact four points that Augustine gave him, Bob gave him, same ones. And Mike's like, that's amazing. But he doesn't believe in prophecy, do you understand, until this event takes place where, where Bob tells him the secrets of his heart. So he begins to believe, you know, Bob, I think, is a prophet. And they're doing night and uh, morning, afternoon, and evening prayer. <clears throat> and they're in April, and April the 13th. And Mike felt impressed, strongly impressed. So, you know, they're just like a few months there. He felt strongly impressed. I need to call a 21-day fast, just like in Daniel 9. And there'll be 500 people come. He felt like the Lord told him that. You understand? He didn't even have vocabulary for that, the Lord telling him. And he said, I got to call Bob Jones. So the next day he called Bob Jones and he said to Bob, I've heard this so many times in the past three weeks. He said, Bob, you're never going to believe what happened in prayer yesterday. And Bob said, oh, yes, I do. Come over here and I'll tell you exactly what happened to you in prayer yesterday. So he goes over to Bob's house and Bob said, well, I saw the angel Gabriel yesterday. If you're going to check out on that, it's okay. Um, 
He said, I, it's the third time I've seen the angel Gabriel. And Gabriel came to me and he said, give the young man Daniel chapter 9 and underline the beginning of it where it's a 21 day of fast and tell him that he's to call for a 21 day fast and uh, tell him that there will be 500 people that come and he is to begin it on May the 7th uh, which was, I don't know, a few weeks, from, about a month from there, uh, or less than a month, May the 7th, 1983. And that is going to be the beginning of what I am going to be doing here in terms of a movement that is going to touch the, the entire world. And so Mike is just taken back. And Gabriel said, and tell him that on the first day of the fast, the 21 days of fasting, there's going to be a comet in the sky that's not even going to be anticipated. And it's not going to be known, but it's going to be seen and acknowledged. And that is a sign to you that God is the one, because that can't be manipulated by mankind. Mankind didn't even know it was coming. And uh, that's going to be a sign in the heavens to verify that I have called this and Gabriel has mentioned these things to Bob. So Bob told all these things, so they did. So uh, 1983, 14th, uh, Bob Jones said, this is part of what Job said. Bob said that Gabriel visited him saying, give the young man Daniel 9 and he will understand. The fast would be confirmed on May the 7th by a comet, uh, 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 unpredicted, by scientists, on May the 7th, a local newspaper reported a comet unpredicted by scientists that did appear in the sky. And the explanation given in the local newspaper was it was luck that the, that the observatory had the telescope pointed to that particular part of the sky because or otherwise they wouldn't have seen the comet, and that was only luck. Of course, that's what the newspaper said. So during that time of fasting, and Mike says that fast was horrible, None of them were, they didn't have patience. I can use that and use it in the current vernacular of New Covenant. They didn't have patience. Um, they, they, they were miserable. Uh, they were dry. They didn't have any music. Uh, everybody had to take turns, three or four turns a day, spending 20 minutes at a microphone praying out loud. Mike said when it was time for another person, he'd look up and everybody would put their head down. They didn't want him to call on them and pick them to go up there. Mike said, over and over, he said, it was awful. You think, well, the good old days, the beginning, that was, he said, it was awful. It was awful. And there were two phenomenal confirmations that took place uh, of things that were going to be big to this group. There was God, harvest coming, and there would be unprecedented power and healings, and there were magnificent things. <clears throat> and God ended the fast on the 20th day. He told Bob he ended the fast because their pride, they, they with pride, it was awful. It was hardly anything to be prideful about. It would start at 6 in the morning and go to 12 at night, and then they'd rush home and sleep what little bit they could sleep, and so they could get back there at 6 o'clock in the morning. And, um, and on the 20th day, God ended it, and they knew. And then uh, Bob Jones said, uh, I have, at the end of that, he says, I've got good news and bad news for you. And Mike said, because uh, Bob was accurate, 100% accurate in everything up to that point in time. What is it? <clears throat> in essence, the good news is that, uh, the bad news is that we are now going to go into a time of spiritual drought. The whole nation's in a spiritual drought. Kansas City is going to go into a literal drought. And because that drought is the, is the status, they were thinking after 21 days, a bunch of Go get her young people. And Mike, you know, if we've done this and all, all this, that, hey, world revival is going to break out the next day. And Bob said, what's going to happen is a drought. We're going to go into a time of drought. And this was 20 days starting on the 7th. So this was the 27th of May. And he said, but on uh, August the 23rd, it's going to rain. There'll be a time of rain because God wants you to know that will not be the breaking of the drought. But he wants you to know there is a time where the drought, the spiritual drought that's gripped the nation and the world, there's a time when that drought will be over. And God knows the time. So he's going to tell you right now, it's going to rain on August the 23rd. And uh, that's so you know that God knows there's a day. And he knows the day. That's not the day. He's just giving you a sign so you'll know God knows the day. And he's having me tell you what? 
a month, month and a half, almost two months ahead of time. It's going to, it won't rain here in Kansas City until the 23rd of August this year. That is what happened. Um, on August the 23rd, they had about 20 minutes of rain right around where the IHOP facility was. They were rejoicing. They were all happy again. And uh, y yes, the rain, and they misinterpreted it again and thought this is going to really mean that the drought in the earth is over. And, uh, <clears throat> and it went right back into the drought even though it, it, it rained for a short time period and they acknowledged it and Bob Jones proved to be right again. And Mike was again, uh, he was languishing over, was this God? Was this really God? That 21 days, was that really with God and supposed Gabriel? I know these things worked out and I know it rained, but I don't, it just, there's such confusion he had because it wasn't turning out the way he thought it was going to turn out. So, on November the 7th, Bob said, go to Mike and tell him that on the, the, 20, the 15th, on November the 7th, he said, on November the 15th, you are going to have a revelation direct from heaven, and you're never going to doubt again. You will never doubt. Now, you have to understand I'm reading this word for word. And there are terms in that fifth message, Gideon's army, Elijah, the things that we've been talking about, God's choosing people. I, I never use the word cull, but God was making selections. We've used those terms. They were using those terms. I'm reading it, and about halfway through the day, I go upstairs to Faye. She was working in her office, and that's when she reminded me sometime around lunchtime on Thursday, which was November the 1st. You, you know, this is November the 1st, and I'm reading these things about timing. And I was overcome with timing. And I know how I got to that place on Thursday that just happened. I know that it came into my heart. Try and figure out, you know, when is the approximate-ish starting time period, not of the Lord's coming, but of the great harvest? Approximately, based on what Bob said. There are so many prophets in the earth. and You don't have, you know, you can search YouTube till, uh, for the next millennia and find all the prophecies that there are about the second coming or the harvest or so on, they have no end. But Bob told Mike on November the 7th that on November the 15th, he said, you will never doubt the May 7th, the 1983 start date again. After you have this direct visitation from the throne. And Mike said, he said to Bob, do you mean somebody's going up or somebody's coming down? And Bob said, yes, somebody's going up or somebody's coming down. So as Mike tells the story, um, just leave that on. I put that on prematurely, but just uh, leave it off the screen. Mike tells the story that he was expecting, he was expecting to go up and have a throne, the throne room of God visit. and He was going to go into the throne and God was going to tell him. That's what he was expecting. So at 5 o'clock in the morning, he went to the church. Timing. He went to the church awaiting this visitation because Bob had been correct on everything that he had said. Dates. Uh, 11, uh, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, nothing, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, nothing. And uh, Bob said Mike was frustrated, flabbergasted, frustrated, and he, it hadn't happened. He was mad. He went home. And he tried to go to sleep, but he couldn't sleep, and so he decided... Okay, there's still a little bit of time left. I'm going to go in my office, and I'm going to check my mail out till midnight. So I'll, I'll at least have been awake the whole time period. So here's Mike. He's in his office at his house. He'd left the church. He's very frustrated. 
He'd been told that he was going to get a message straight from the throne. So he picks up his mail. He looks through. He's got a letter from somebody he doesn't know. And he opens it up, and this little book is inside called Placebo. He's looking at this book, Placebo. And he, had, he, he flipped the pages. There's 50 pages. And it was this, he, he read the preface, and he realized it was someone that had, was dead or had a near-death experience and went to heaven. And that was very, uh, Mike is very interested in those things. And he said, I, I can read this book in 45 minutes. It was 11.15 at night. I can read this book in 45 minutes. How did, I love to ask these questions. They swirl on the inside of me. How did that book get there on that day? In the batch of stuff. How come he didn't open it? How come it didn't get there the day before? How did God know seven days ahead of time, whatever, seven, eight days, eight days beforehand? How did God know that on that day there would be in the mail the book Placebo that Mike would choose to read? I, I know the answer. I know the answer because at the post office, that envelope arrived two days early. So there was an angel stationed there and put his sword over the letter and they couldn't see it. And so it got lost for two days because it wasn't supposed to get there for the right day. And when Mike uh, w tried to go to sleep, Fred uh, just uh, was standing over him, just speaking to him. Uh, wake up scripture so he couldn't sleep. And so uh, that the indwelling Holy Spirit said to Mike, go into your office and go through your mail. Now, I think I'll go into my office. I think I'll look at my mail. So he went to his office and looked at his mail. And so uh, Fred there, and there's a smile on Fred because whew, it's here. And he, he opened it up and it caught his attention. And Mike said, <clears throat> I could finish this book in 45 minutes. It'll be midnight in 45 minutes. I can do this. So he starts reading. He gets real engrossed in it. God showed him that he would begin to recruit. So in reading this book, and that point number five that I read everybody, he read that and he, he thought, oh my goodness, those are all things, those are all things. And he gets to the point of th that God told him, you are to begin on May the 7th, 1980. You are to speak exactly three years you're to end in three years. And on that last day, or the day of what would be the fourth year, May the 7th, would have been the beginning of the fourth year. On that day, there's going to be a sign in the sky. And Howard didn't know what that sign was. Mike did, because it had already happened. It had happened earlier that year. About six months earlier, that sign had happened. On that day, God showed him that he, this is God speaking to uh, Howard Pittman, that he would begin to recruit this army in earnest on May the 7th, 1983. That was the first day of the 21-day fast. Accompanied by a heavenly sign, Howard wrote the story in his book, Placebo, published in May of 1980. And Mike's reading this, 1980. This was published in 1980. The fast was May the 7th, 1983. He was given a three-year journey of which he was, it was exactly three years, and God would confirm that journey, those three years of journey at the end of it with a sign in the sky. He didn't know, Howard Pittman didn't know what that sign would be. I'm reading this. It's already been made awakened to me November the 1st. This is November the 1st. He finished the book at either 1158 or 1159. He uses both numbers and said it was either 1158 or 1159 that I finished the book. Timing. I contend that in 1980, when Howard Pittman wrote that book, God knew it would be read by Mike Bickle on the 15th of November, 1983. And he would need it for a confirmation that would settle his heart forever that that fast that took place, because what followed was unbelievable time of drought. That's not what they were expecting. That he would need his heart so fixed that that's how God chose to do it. I'm reading this, I'm reading it on November the 1st. And I realize, God, you've called us. 
we've experienced some very unusual things that myself, none of us really anticipated, yet you gave indications to me in things that have happened in my life earlier that it's really not a shock given the indications that you've given me. And the timing, the timing. So the timing, November the 1st, and why November the 1st is so significant to me, because that's the first day the induction notices now, for the first 15 years, I had no knowledge of it. The things that have taken place, have we as a local church had a significant impact in Russia? Is it just a fly-by-night thing to say, oh, yeah, I think Russia, we'll just pick a country. You know that is so far from the truth. It's extraordinary, the, op the, the things that we have done as a small church now, a real small church. It's extraordinary. How it's been done it's not been done because of our efforts it's been done because it was the Lord and he's called it into being he set it in motion it was set in motion from the very first day that we met we were just trying to be a family church that valued family and be good we wanted to be nice in the city that's 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 what we sought to do minister to the family be nice love God <clears throat> um, I need to back up I'm um, okay, good. God showed him that he would begin to recruit this army in earnest on May the 7th, 1983. That was in Howard Pittman's book. Howard Pittman, uh, Mike had him come to the IHOP. They spent hours and hours together on multiple occasions. Mike wanted to find out all about this man and his life and these visits that he had to heaven. Uh, but he accepted it on that November the 15th. Uh, Howard wrote the story in his book, Placebo. It's published in May 1980. So, number four, NCF and Placebo. I have, to some significant degree, I was personally reading these things on November the 1st this year. Timing, timing, timing. The IHOP and NCF. So impacted, influenced. So impacted and influenced by, uh, by Bob Jones, that ministry. And for Mike, the point was the start date. The first day of the fast, God said, he, through the book, what I'm doing is I'm beginning in earnest to now recruit. That, that recruiting is still going on. But that was the first, that was the day that it was beginning. The first day of the fast. It didn't take place in the months that followed most immediately, even though they had some of the most remarkable, miraculous signs. There was still doubt in his heart. Is this God? Is it, is it really? And it's through Howard Pittman and uh, placebo. Do I think God had all that? Absolutely. The point, what's made it so impactful to me is, I knew the day was November the 1st. And I know we came into being and God had a destiny for us that he chose. We didn't choose it. And timing, timing, timing is so very, very important. Okay, number five. I'll try and make it through this. Timing of the billion soul harvest as seen through the pro prophetic eyes of Bob Jones. So... In those three weeks, I have been studying this, reading it, coming to understanding. But it was the events of that day of November the 1st when I read the book Placebo again through. And I, I've read portions of it a number of years ago. But if you asked me what was in the book Placebo, I would have said, I don't really remember. It was pretty important to Mike Bickle. I know that, but I, I can't. I just don't remember. They were awakened like lightning to me. Um, on November the 1st uh, because God chose uh, I, I think Fred was there telling me um, forget November the 1st forget it Russ don't even think about it don't think about November the 1st don't think about November the 1st till I went up and dialogue with Faye around lunchtime and uh, then he told Faye mention, mention to Russ about November the 1st it's our start date it could be the Holy Spirit God is interacting with us all the time. Now, I know there are people, I don't believe that. It's a, okay, you live your life your way. Timing of the billion soul harvest. It's complicated. 
It has layers. That's what threw me off initially. There are layers. What I won't end up with is a start date. That I won't end up there. I'll end up with, well, it's between probably these two or three years. Dates, dates, dates. This is Bob Jones and Wesley Campbell. January 22nd, 1973. January 22nd, 1973, if you recognize the date, was the Roe versus Wade decision date. What God told Bob back then was that on that date, it was the intention of Satan and his kingdom to destroy the deliverers, those that he was bringing up with a view on the end time harvest. And it was the specific intention to destroy them. And Bob Jones said God told him that the devil didn't get them all. And that that was a start date. That time period, January 22nd, 1973. And 30 years would go by. And when 30 years would go by, which would make it 2003, is when those who... Uh, were saved from abortion in that earliest uh, onslaught of, of abortion that took place when Roe versus Wade was, that, that, that decision came from our Supreme Court. God said they would be ready to step into their priesthood ministry and that ministry would be preparing harvesters for the end time harvest. And the significant date would be 30 years, the amount of time that Jesus was preparing and it would start in 73, and in 2003, of which Bob repeatedly said to Wes Campbell, what an important date that is, year, that is 2003. The Lord began to speak to him and tell him that they were trying to kill his, God's deliverers, trying to kill believers when great deliverers were being born. Uh, dates, 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 Bob Jones and Wes Campbell, August the 8th, 1975. This is uh, Bob Jones. This is when Bob Jones died, um, and he went to heaven, and he was prepared to, he was glad to leave this earth, and Jesus said, no, the devil killed you prematurely. I want you to go back for a billion souls, cutting it short. He's willing to go back. He said, I'm sending you back for one billion in 2000, and I will start at that time. He said to Bob, I'm going to start at that time. There are multiple times that you will read, I'm going to begin, I'm going to begin to raise up the deliverers, I'm going to begin to, uh, to enlist, uh, I'm going to release in 1981, November. There are different start dates. It's way beyond, it's way beyond me. And in the explanations that are given, it's way beyond understanding. Well, well, what exactly is that? What is that? There are many levels that God was starting and there was a time period when they were starting. We, New Covenant, were kind of right in the middle of that time period when things were starting. There's not a single start date. I'm sending you back for a billion in 2000, and I will start it at that time. So dates, dates. This is Bob Jones and Wesley Campbell. So 2000, in, in this, there is this discussion. So they're talking, and Bob said, well, what's going to take place is in 2000 to 2012 is the first wave of the harvest. Bob would say that the end time global harvest has already begun. The first wave of the harvest. Now, to, to make it a little easier, uh, I'll, come, I'll come back to this, uh, but in listening to Bob Jones and Mike Bickle describe this, that basically there are three 20-year time periods. And basically the 80s and the 90s where we come in in the beginning, where International High Hop comes into the beginning, where Howard Pittman comes in, all of those things find their, in the, in the very early 1980s, the 80s and the 90s, that 20 year time period is the, um, is the leadership, the key leadership that God enlisted. They may not make it all the way to, to the harvest. They may drop out, may make it as calls. They may have other agendas. They just may not, they just might not be interested. And there may be other things that God has called them to. But in the 80s and the 90s, basically it's the calling of those who are going to be somewhat fathers to it, somewhat, and New Covenant, I believe, we have a very specific calling. That 
that is specifically to Russia, that is specifically to believe, to awaken the prophetic destiny of that nation, which we have done, and to believe that God is going to use a man like the name of Seraphim, and he is going to use him, he's going to move a bell, he's going to ring a bell, the whole thing's going to start with a bell. It's very much Jesus, when he comes back, it's going to start with a trumpet, there's going to be a sound, that's the largest bell in the world. Uh, it doesn't prove a thing, but it's sure, well, that's an interesting comparison that's going to be taking place. He's looking for a people who will believe that and have faith in it and call for it and confess it. And once the, the global harvest takes, springs forth, we'll be plenty busy here. We will, because uh, we've been told in great detail all the things that will be taking place here. But, so in that, the 80s and the 90s, then there are things taking place in the 20s, the, 10, the 2000s, and the 2010. So on a different occasion, uh, Bob and Wes Campbell were talking, the first wave is 2000, 2012. If you pay attention, so many of the people that you know of have started youth training centers during this time period. Toronto has uh, um, Bill Johnson, Redding, California, uh, Grace, uh, uh, not Grace Ministries, uh, over in Mon uh, no, what, Rick Joyner has schools. They're, they're, um, Randy Clark has schools. Uh, Iris Ministries, there's a huge impact. That's just people that I know. There's people all over the world that have started these things. There are three levels there's the group of leaders who ultimately are going to be in leadership. They're dealt with in the 80s and the 90s. That's us. In the 2000s and the 2010s, there's the second level, in essence, the sons, using 1 John, the sons of the fathers. It's, it, it's, it's not cut and point off, cut and point off. It's very fluid. It's life. It's like how lives overlapped each other. But basically, the first 20 years is the calling of leaders. We're in that. Mike Bickle, International House of Prayer, is in that. In the 2000 to 2010s, which we are real close to just the last year of that, it's when the second level is, those are the sons. Now, those are young people who have been raised up in all of these training centers and the harvesters <clears throat> have been identified as those who are the children of this age. So the spiritual children of those who are, the, there's the fathers, the young men, and the children, 1 John 2. The spiritual fathers, basically it's a 60 year, it's an approximate 60 year deal. Of which the first 20 years are raising up the first generation, the fathers. The second 20 years is raising up the second generation, the children. Who will be involved in the harvest, but they are the ones who will be recruiting and investing in the lives of the youngest ones. And predominantly, the youngest ones are the ones who are going to carry the great harvest all over the world. It's largely going to be the very young. It's going, the, the leadership is going to be the older ones. We fall into the older ones category. And the middle, everybody's involved. There's signs and wonders in every group. But the last group are, is the most key group in terms of it's the young, it's the youth. So having said that, during the middle group, the young men, so to speak, 1 John 2, the men and women that are the second generation, so to speak, the first generation called in the first 20 years, is 20 to 2012, the first wave, it's already happened. 2013 to 2019, the second wave, it's almost finished. The third wave is 2020 until who knows how long. Is it 20 years? Is it 30 years? Is it 18 years? 2020, approximately, these are ish, is when the third generation, the very young. So dates, dates, dates. This is Bob Jones and Mike Bickle. The 80s and the 90s, they say in their material, is the first generation. The 20s and the 2010s is the second, uh, it, it is the second generation and three waves of the second generation. 
and 2020 and 2030s are the grandchildren. They are the primary harvesters. It will be the young. Mike Bickle, when he, in 1982, because he went to Kansas City in 83, 82, he went to visit the, the poorest of the poor in the world. And he, when, he, when he went to Cairo, Egypt, God told him he had an audible visit with God, walked into his room and said, I'm going to change the understanding and the expression of Christianity in the whole globe in one generation. Mike thought it was going to happen right then. No, nah, it's going to happen it's getting ready to happen. The early stages of it are happening. But there's going to be a generation where this, and, and we're right on the edge of it, where the understanding of what is Christianity, it's Acts, it's Acts, the book of Acts. It's the ministry of Jesus. That it's, the church is going to be, oh, that's what church is supposed to be like. That's what church is supposed to do, what Jesus did. That's what it's supposed to look like, what Jesus looked like, what the Acts looked like. What Elijah looked like. That's what it's supposed to look like. And there will be a generation. Mike thought it would happen in 1983. And he's just now on the edge of it. And he realizes and says, I know it's my grandchildren who are, so to speak, his physical grandchildren, his spiritual grandchildren, my grandchildren are going to be the primary harvesters. I will be involved in apostolic leadership and that kind of a thing. But the harvesters, the ones who are, their youth who will have the strength, they're the ones, they're the primary harvesters are the youth. They're the ones, Bob Jones says, will um, walk in the order of Melchizedek, primarily. They're the ones, the harvesters. I remember when I went to Randy Clark conference and Kale Mumby, a Canadian, Kale Mumby it was so encouraging to me. Kale Mumby said he had a dream, and, and in the dream, the leaders of the revival, and he said they were all 25 years old. They weren't old people. They were all 20. They were young. And he said uh, they met with me, and the world was ablaze. They said, he said, they sat around a circle. I was an old man. He said, he's young. He's early 40s. And he said, in this dream, I was an old man. I had a long white beard and big belly. And he said, they were asking me, tell us how it started. He said, the wor they said, they told him, the world is ablaze. And the leaders, he named the countries, uh, the United States, Israel, Egypt. He named a bunch of countries that he, the leaders were sitting there interviewing him, tell him how he started. And his answer was, he didn't know what the answer was, his answer was the burning ones. It was started by the burning ones. That's how it was started. In essence, he was saying it was the prayer furnaces. It was the burning ones, the ones who burned with prayer, uh, calling after God, going after revival. Well, Seraphim is the burning one. I believe he's the first burning one. Does that mean there aren't people calling out? There's all kinds of people calling out. What do you think we're doing when we're praying in the Spirit? We're mostly calling out for, I believe, for God's purposes in the earth and how he wants us to interact and be a part of his purposes. The 20s and the 30s, the grandchildren, they will be the primary harvesters. So dates, dates, dates. One billion youth. I believe that it was, Bob Jones said this in an interview that's on YouTube, Bob Jones and um, Extreme Prophetic, the gal who leads Extreme Prophetic, Pat King. And Bob says this, it's easy to find. He said, I will, this is his quote, it will be one billion youth, I believe that it will probably begin around the year 2020. He would say, it actually began... 1980, 19, uh, May the 7th, 1983. For us, it actually began November the 1st, 1981. And people have been going through training and being approved and enduring and staying the course and staying available to God. I believe, so this was his statement. You can watch him make it. I believe that it will probably begin. He's talking about the third generation. Does that mean there's no second generations that will be involved? They don't mean that at all. But the bulk of them will be the grandchildren. The bulk of the leadership will be the first generation. The second generation will be those who are part of schools, and they'll be going after young people. And they'll recognize there'll be such fertileness in dealing with the very young from one-year-old up to 20-year-old. And those are fluid. They're not rigid lines. 
that, that's going on. So that's from May the 13th, 2011, extreme prophetic. So Wesley Campbell and Bob Jones. Bob said that God told Howard Pittman that he would launch the end time harvest on May the 7th, 1983, and there would be a sign of this in the sky. It would not be anticipated. And I was reading that with great interest and clarity on November the 1st. In my heart, that confirmed our November the 1st, 1981. That confirmed, that's when God started. We're going through that maturation process. We're close to the end. I had Steve uh, Strozik come to me and said, there's a 12-year-old boy who plays the guitar. He'd kind of like to join it. I almost shouted for joy. I said, ah, you know, you ought to give him a chance. Let, just let him try. Because the, the young people, the youth, are going to be the primary harvesters. We're all going to have a shot at it. We're, we're, we're going to be involved. And, but they're going to be the primary ones. So we have a 12-year-old who wants to play on our worship team. Let him do it. Let him practice. Go for it. Um, so 1973 to 2003, trying to put them all together, is the deliverers. And so who were they in 2003? Well, if, if you spend much time seeing internet of some of the phenomenal things that are ministries, there's ministries where people who have metal in them, the metal, the metal melt and come out. I was going to show uh, it, what is to me the greatest miracle I have ever, apart from the ministry of Jesus, the single greatest miracle I have ever heard of. I've never heard of one like this. Come next Wednesday night and you'll hear about it. So 1973 to 2003, the deliverers. 2000 to 2012, the first wave of the second generation, which are raising up the third generation that are the primary, uh, the primary voices that God's going to use all over the world. And they're the ones that are going to walk in the kind of power that has been promised to the end time church, as well as the other groups 2013 to 2019, the second wave of the second group. 2020 to 2000, no, no, that's the big one. That's, uh, that's the third set of 20, the grandchildren. And so Mike and Bob at 1988, they were saying, they understood it's our grandchildren, our spiritual grandchildren, our physical grandchildren, our spiritual grandchildren. They're the ones who are going to have the energy and the willingness to expend their life. You have people like Esther Thurman, Hadassah. I think she's still in the room. You, you know, pardon? Yes, but but she's back. And, and she's, I think she, they're, they're fluid. So I, I think of her as she's second, third generation. She's willing to expend her life, go to Nepal and spend her life in Nepal. And, you know, some of those older ones are, you sure, are you sure you know what you're doing? Is that what you want to do? Yeah, I want to go on those mountains and proclaim Christ. And there's going to be hundreds of thousands of kids that are just like that. They're what God is raising up. It's going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity in one generation. So 1982 to 1990s, 2000, 2010s, 2020s, and 30s, all have an ish. Well, Russ is telling us exactly when the second coming. I've not talked about the second coming. I'm talking about the great harvest. So kind of, so um, resurrections and the end time harvest. It's been fascinating to me. Just, you can put it on a shelf if you want to. So these three things, quickly. Tommy Hicks, 1960, three times saw this harvest, which we've read it, we've gone over it. It's real interesting that what started this, Tommy Hicks was very, very, very uh, disappointed, discouraged by the state of the church back in 1960. He was thinking, where, where is this spotless bride going to come from? And he, he was really, really, really discouraged. And he got a letter 
that there was an indigenous couple in Africa that he was supporting, had begun to support a year or two before, and they'd gone into a village that had been wiped out by a plague, and they, they encountered maybe the last of the people leaving the village, and they, wh where's everybody going? Why? Well, there's a plague. And they told him, actually, our parents are right there in that hut, and we've just left them. We're not burying them because we don't want to catch the plague. And they said, where? Show us where they are. So they walk in there, and they raise the parents from the dead. They write that in a letter. They send it back to Tommy Hicks. He's incredibly encouraged. What, what, and one or two nights later is, as my understanding, is when he had the first of three times of the exact same vision of that giant that was laying down, covered north-south, and had demons and debris and all kinds of yuck, and rose up and became harvesters that went over the whole globe. How did it begin? It was a resurrection. Number two, Bob Jones how in 1980, 1975 is when Jesus told him about the billion soul harvest. Well, he had died. He went to heaven. And Jesus told him, he said, no, I want to send you back. The devil killed you, but he, he, that wasn't supposed to be. Now, you could stay if you want, but I want to send you back for a billion souls. Bob said, I'll do it. What was it that launched all of that? It was a resurrection. Who's Bob's. But does that prove seraphim? No, it doesn't prove seraphim. It is interesting. Howard Pittman, 1979, writes the book Placebo. Well, how, what was his story? He died. He died of a, a, a trunk artery that burst, and he goes to heaven. He wants to plead that he could have more time. Jesus said to him, he was told over the wall, you can come in, but you can't go back out until Jesus comes to the earth with his army. Uh, or you can go back. He chose to go back. And then he was ultimately sent back with an assignment. That was a message that had five points. How did it begin? He died. He had a resurrection. Jesus is coming back. In the first coming, Jesus came in a miraculous birth. John the Baptist was the forerunner. He had a miraculous birth. Not as miraculous as Jesus Jesus was the immaculate conception. John, his parents were dead reproductively. God gave them life, and they had a miracle son. Not identical, but it was in the, um, that arena. Jesus is coming from the invisible realm. He's coming from heaven, someone who's been dead 2,000 years. If it's the same kind of pattern, then it's not uh, a heresy to think, well, there is another, the spirit of Elijah is going to come prior to the great and terrible day of the Lord, which hasn't happened yet. That's the end of time. That's, that's the, the great tribu tribulation. We're 20, 30 years away from that. Um, it's, key, it's, it's in keeping with the pattern that well, he'll rise from the dead too. The forerunner will arise from the dead. It doesn't prove it. It's very interesting to me. Bob Jones on his tombstone, he saw Bob and Mike talk about his tombstone. He saw a tombstone with his name on it, and he was dead, and he saw a rose of Sharon growing out of his tomb, and he saw that, uh, he said, the body of Christ, the bride, is going to come up out of his grave. In other words, he's going to be. And so Bob Jones' tombstone vision, even after Bob's time, that she would grow the body of Christ, the church, and that she would bloom and that she would come forth, come forth even out of the graves. That's Bob's quote as he was talking with Mike Bickle about it. She, the church, the bride, would come forth even out of the graves. He died February 14th, 2014. These don't prove that we're still awaiting it, but he made it clear. God showed him he was going to die before it launched. Well, he died in 2014. Norval Hayes, 42, 34, and 8, 40. Oh, man. Um, I don't know what time it is. Have I gone over my time? It's just now 7.45. Oh, um, I want to go backwards. Journey to Mount Carmel. Remember in the uh, Howard Pittman's? This, it's a very fertile time for me. It may not seem it to you, but it certainly does to me. 
that when we went to Andrew Womack and heard him minister, the last message was on 1 Kings 18, and the, the, mess, the heart of the message was the provision of God is at the there of God, meaning wherever God says, I want you to go there, and that's where the provision that he's providing is there. If you go over here, you won't have that provision that he's provided over there. And while he was giving that message, I thought, ah, oh, the journey. He never talked about Mount Carmel, which was one of the greatest uh, confrontations uh, that I think is in the scriptures, is uh, on Mount Carmel. And did you know in Mount Carmel, when uh, the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal and 400 of uh, Ashtaroth prophets, so there were 850 prophets, false prophets, that there's a 12-12 in that story? Now, when I say 12-12, 12-12, when we talk about 12-12, okay, the clock that um, was seen, uh, it was a digital clock, so it was 12-12. It was related to the same thing. 12, 12, it's a chapter and verse. They're, they're connected together, either by verse and chapter or clocks. They're convected by, well, it's 12 hours, 12 minutes, 12, 12. They're not separated widely. And so the thought occurred to me in one of the times that I read through it is um, there's a 12, 12 here that's connected. It's not widely dispersed. It's connected together. Where? When he built the altar, you know how many stones he built it out of? 12 stones for the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, they have to be connected. I haven't read it. I didn't hear anybody say it. It was just like, because I believe part of seraphim rising from the dead, that bell moving, that is going to have the impact for the world that Mount Carmel had for the nation of Israel. We are not talking about a small thing. We're talking about a globe impacting thing. Is there going to be anybody in the earth that's going to believe it? I am. You can be. They had four jars of water, and they filled them how many times? Three times. They poured four jars of water. They filled them a second time, poured them out. That makes eight. They filled them a third time, poured them out, and that makes what? Twelve. There were 12 jars of water poured out on what? The altar, the 12 stones with the bowl on it. Does that prove it's Romans 12, 12 for New Covenant Fellowship in Knoxville, Tennessee? No. Is it beyond, um, that's random. It's way beyond random. It's way beyond random. Because that's in reality what we are being called to do. You believe, I've had people tell me that, you believe the bell is going to move through the air? Yeah, I do. You know, there's nothing impossible with God. There's nothing. And he's saving the best for last. We, we're coming up to the best. He said greater works they're going to do. It's going to be the greatest. So should we be shocked that, well, there's things we've never heard of before. It's not fair to you. So this, this is the greatest miracle I have ever heard of apart from the ministry of Jesus. And I will not fault you if you'll kind of shake your head and you'll want to just say, I got to really think about that one. Uh, in conclusion, it's a Norval Hayes story. And there was a 21-year-old man, Baptist pastor, whose sister was hopelessly demonized because of a terrible accident she had and the amount of pain she had. The hospital were giving her uh, for months and months just vials and vials of the strongest stuff they could give her for her to inject with needles because the level of pain she was dealing with. She was hooked on alcohol. She was demonized. And someone had told them, if you take that girl to a Norval Hayes meeting, she'll be delivered. Well, he was 21 years old. He didn't believe in a Norval Hayes meeting. 
He didn't believe in speaking in tongues. He didn't believe in the Holy Spirit moving upon people. He didn't believe in laying hands on the sick. But his sister was demonized and they couldn't do anything. That's not the greatest, it's a pretty good one, but it's not the greatest miracle. So they bring their daughter. Every day, Norval at that meeting would say, I, I can't remember what the daughter, what the, it was his sister, it was this guy's sister. She was three years older than him. He was 21, Baptist pastor. D didn't like and probably disagreed with everything that was taking place. And every day, Norval would have, let's say the sister's name was Gloria. And they said, say with me, thank you, Jesus, for healing Gloria, for delivering her of all of the demons. Thank you, Jesus, for healing Gloria. He was so upset with Norval. How can he say that? You can't say that. So there came a night that he called for a healing line. And he said, uh, everybody who wants to have hands laid on, pray for the sick. Uh, if you'll come forward, a lot of people came forward. It was a conference. It was a Norval Hayes conference up in uh, Indiana. And so the people lined the wall. He said, line around the walls. And he said to them, uh, our young Baptist pastor is going to pray for you. So he calls up this 21-year-old young Baptist pastor. And he stands there in front of Norval at the first person of the line. And he looks to about the fifth person down the line. And he said, he'd never seen any. This is not the miracle. He'd never seen anything like this, but her mouth was over here on her cheek. That she wasn't, it wasn't born in the right place. It wasn't down here above her chin. It was way over here. And he took a look at that, and he said to himself, they never taught me, I don't even know how to lay hands on the sick. I don't have a clue. And I'm going to heal all these people? And he said he started crying. And he looked at Norma, he said, I don't know how to lay hands on the sick. I don't know. And he said, Norval said, oh, brother. So he went over to him. He took his hand, and he said, now take your hand. He took his left hand. Now take your hand. He's, I'll put my hand on top of you, and you take your hand, and you go over, and you just gently put it on the forehead of the first person, and you don't push them, and you don't hit them, but you just gently put your hand on them, and... Then you go to the next person. That's all you do. He said, don't slap them, don't hit them, just gently lay your hand. So he went up to the first person. He laid hands on the first person. This is not the miracle. And the whole, all the way around the room, all the way around the room, every single person in the line fell down. And he heard the cracking like a branch, and the mouth of this person, third or fourth person, move from the cheek to here. That's not the great, that's a pretty good one. Do you understand? If you had one of those a month, you'd feel like you had a pretty good month. Two days later. A woman comes up to him and says. And she has documentation with her to the Baptist pastor. Two days later, she comes up to the Baptist pastor who's still there. And she said, two days ago, when you prayed for us, really, he prayed for one person. When you prayed for us, he said, my husband and I have always desired children. And she said, uh, I had a complete hysterectomy. Everything was taken out. And I happened to have an appointment about a week ago with the doctor who took everything out. It's all gone. And he checked me because he just wanted to know if I was doing okay. And he checked me. When I stood in that line, I asked God for a new womb and new ovaries. And I, I've heard of that many times. A womb coming back and ovaries coming. Many times I've heard of that. I asked God to recreate in me a new womb, a new ovaries. That will happen here. And she said, I went back to the doctor the next day after you prayed for me and asked him, would you examine me again? Wh who's the name of the guy, Faye? Rod Parsley. Rod Parsley is the 21-year-old. 
he retold this story at Norval Hayes' funeral, which was a week or so ago, 30-some years afterwards. He said, the lady came up to him with documentation. She said, I went to the doctor since you prayed for me, and I have all of my ovaries and everything, and I am three months pregnant. And she said, here's the documentation. That kind of stuff is going to be way more common because we are entering into the greatest time of harvesting in the history of humanity. It will far exceed what Jesus did. And it's hard to be. I, I, it, it will be the numbers all, all over the world. And he said, they'll do greater things than I did. I've never heard of such a miracle. Yes, that her ovaries were replaced. Yes, that, that those things. But that she was three months pregnant. And that raises you for you all the kinds of questions I have. So we've called. <laughs> we've called because just, oh my goodness. We called their church. We called Rod Parsley's church. Spoke to people. And Rod Parsley was at Norval's funeral three weeks ago. And um, his, fun his entire funeral service is on our website uh, under Norval Hayes. Um, and you can hear him. He talks about it. Talks about the woman with the mouth on the side. And yes, the last night Norval went over to the sister and he said God told her, told him to hold, grab her, not grab her, to hold on to her because the devil wanted to kill her and not let her go and keep commanding the devil to come out. Rod Parsley's testimony 30 years ago and three weeks ago is he held on to her for two hours and 45 minutes commanding the devil to leave. And she was completely delivered. And he said, that's how he started. That's coming. If, if you spend time on the internet, there's more and more stories of things that are taking place. And I, I want to tell you that I believe what's been so encouraging to my heart is the same thing that happened to Mike Bickle when it got settled in his heart, that 21-day fasting, 20-day fasting time period really was of God, and it was set in motion things, and his heart was set there. That November the 1st, 1981, we did, we, because it was New Covenant. It wasn't me, it was we. Yes, I do believe I have received one, but we received one. Because we have gone to Russia. We have done all of the filming. It's a we that we have done. I believe it's what he has given to us. So, I have been, um, I'm going to try and back up. I want to go to the one where I have Norval Hayes. If you could find it for me, please. I've listened to, I don't know, 50, 60 messages by Norval. The message that launched him was the healing of Zona, his daughter. And uh, I have recently heard the, the best ending of the story that I've ever heard, more detail, of Zona's healing, that he did go to heaven. He didn't see God. He heard God say, if you'll curse the roots of those warts and command them to die, that they will, and you're the head of the house, and you shouldn't have, in essence, permitted that to take place. And he said, you are to believe and not doubt. And he says repeatedly, 40 days and 40 nights. I confess for 40 days and 40 nights, thank Jesus, thank you for healing Zona. Thank you for healing Zona. She got that she was mocking him. 
about 30 days out. He was in the backyard of his house, he says, and uh, Zona had just got home from school, and she came out on the back porch, and she said, Dad, I have a question, okay? She said, I, I hate these warts. I count them every day. For 42, I know 42 is the number in the Bible for the comings again of Christ. I've thought that many times. God, what, is, is there insight here? He said, I count these, I hate these things. I count them every day. There's 34. Eight of them are gone. Where did they go? And Norville said, he told her, who cares? She said, I've looked for them on the floor in my bedroom. I can't find them. Who, who cares? Now, eight is the number for new beginnings. God works with numbers. It's part of his vocabulary. I just, okay, now that, that's a, such a specific number. So that 30 left over, that's a, that, that's a very important number, the 42. For five years, it stayed at 42. She had a few. They had them cut off when she was 10 or 11. They had them surgically cut off, and they grew back and sprouted a garden, and the garden grew to 42 and stayed at 42. For all those years, it stayed at 42. That's really significant. He tells over and over, 40 days and 40 nights, 40 days and 40 nights. That's a time of testing. So I found myself thinking, well, now that's really interesting. 40 days and 40 nights. I wonder if that's 40 years. I wonder if you say, okay, what's 40 years from... November the 1st, 1981. When do 40 years come? Well, that's 1991 is 10, 2001 is 20, 2011 is 30, 2021 is 40. Ooh. Well, if it began May the 7th, 1983, uh, with the fast, the 21... And if you add 40 to that, what's 83 plus 40? Well, 2023. I wonder if those are issues. I wonder if that 40 year time of trying, testing, I wonder if that's going to find expression. It wouldn't surprise me. Have I just said that the global harvest won't stop until 2021? I didn't say that. Actually, if it's 40 days and 40 nights, if it's 20 years, you know, 40 years and 40, it's like uh, the full the full 40th year. So you're at the 41st year. So that pushes the date even closer to where the IHOP one is, and it's like, oh my goodness. If you do from the 1980, then you add 40 years to 1980. They, it, it's, it's fluid, it's not exactly, but it's pointing to a time period. I'm telling you, this is the time to make it count. Because I believe we are so close. It could be 2020. It could be 2021. It could be 2022. It could be 2023. It could be in there. Well, that's a lot of time. Compared to 6,000 years of humanity, it's not even an eyelash blink. It is so close. What are we to do? Rejoice in hope. Endure tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. That's what we're to do. So I wanted to share these things with you as I have been spending my time filling myself with these things. I'm incredibly encouraged because I believe our start date has been just as confirmed to us as it was to Mike Bickle, the start date of the International House of Prayer. And we're all coming 
If you say it's 40 years, the time of testing, if you do that, boy, it's for the start, not the conclusion, the start. It's like, boy, they, they kind of all those dots all are pretty close to each other. They're pretty close to each other. If you start in 1973 with the Roe versus Wade, if you start with 1975 when Bob Jones died and went to heaven, if you start in 1980 when Howard Pittman died and went to heaven, if you start in 1981 when New Covenant began and the first induction notices were sent out, if you start in May the 7th, 1983, when in earnest God was raising up, I mean, they, they all cluster and we're there. We're there. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. I know it's gone long.